So the science started in conventional agriculture with Elaine, Dr. Elaine Ingham, and uh, conventional agriculture is a, is a thing, and it's not interested in those technologies, techniques, and there's a massive effort to keep them out of that area. So kind of the cool thing is where they're being really embraced and picked up is within the cannabis industry, and these are the people that are living inside a forest. So um, I feel like what we do is a form of ecological restoration. If I can... If I can fix your farm, the forest will fix itself from inside your farm. And so um, the intense production model of the um, uh, states of like Nevada, um, they went big with warehouses and this heavy production model. And um, so their analysis of that process was a very quick learning curve. And each week you're bringing new batches of plants in on you know, a 200,000 square foot building. There's a lot of learning to have right there. And the same thing's happening in light depth. Um, I can go and help a corn farmer and turn around one season and learn a specific set of information from that interaction. And then I can go to a light depth greenhouse and I can have five full harvests in a calendar year. So for every year, I get five full opportunities to learn. And that is propelling the cannabis, light depth, and high production indoor people I mean, decades and decades and decades ahead of the conventional agriculture. And so I think the long-term implications of that are really hopeful because we're going to hit a point where the average age of the farmer that's growing our food is 62, retires. Their kids are now lawyers because farming is not a prosperable business in the mega scale. And um, we're going to have a tremendous amount of really educated, talented farmers that know more responsible ways to produce food and they've been working with altering environments, and I think that's gonna be needed for human survivability. So that's kind of what I'm all about. I'm trying to help those people and try to help that movement. Um, people take what I say really personally, but I'm, I'm here for human survivability, and the way I'm doing that is by communicating what's happening in the soil to cannabis farmers, and that's a really enjoyable thing to do with my life. I believe the question is about integrating food production and cannabis production into the regulated market. Um, the reason why that question is asked is, there seems to be the farther you get away from suburban America or integrated, heavily, densely populated growing areas, you start to end up with organic, living soil, um, sustainable practice farmers that are growing their food along with their cannabis. And I think it came out of a need because these are the same people that don't want to live off food from the center store. And so they're trying to grow their own food. So naturally, just they threw it in with the beds of cannabis. And that turned into making really good food. Um, it also turns out the farther you get off the road and the more vegetables are grown with the cannabis, the bigger the plants get. Um, the reason why that happens is in a living soil system, the nutrients are produced by organism to organism interactions. Those organisms are fed through plant root relationships. So the more roots you can get into that living soil, the more surface area you have for the potential of producing nutrients. And that's exactly what happens. And that was a really fun transition for me. Like, started out going to you know the chemical farmers in the mountains and the better i got at the microscope the farther i got off the road and the more food was being grown with plants uh you have there is so many there's so many specifics about no wood there's you know certain growing materials you can use there's certain things inside and in, outside of the building um so we don't i don't think an approach to surviving the regulated era would we grow food in with the plant just because of the complications, but we can take that learning lesson into the regulated area and we can replace the food with cover crops that host mycorrhizal fungi. We can, we can grow plants that host these banks of populations of organisms that produce nutrients in the soil. So we still carry that mentality and that, that um, method for success, but the regulated, it's, it's a sticky thing. And, um, but we've, we've had, um, a uh, wide array of root vegetables that grow. Um, the brassicas are helpful in starting the system because they're early successional plants. They become antagonistic earlier on, but they are good for starting a system. And so we've had cover crop blends that had root vegetables in it and all kinds of wild things. So you still, you still can carry the uh, method for success, but it might be really complicated. Uh, there are a lot of people that are entering the regulated market with brands, and they also grow food. 
Um, so whether those happen at the same exact location, um, I don't know. That would be risky, I think. Just because now you're combining two regulatory bodies, so I'd probably keep them separate. W w if we can move out of uh, fear of problem mindset and we can move away from being afraid of things, we can quantify them mathematically and address them with um, uh, a cost-effective approach. And that just takes a mentality shift to the facility. But people are absolutely succeeding in the regulated market. They're absolutely thriving in the regulated market, doing living soils with beneficial insects and no chemicals in the building at all. And that would be my um, suggestion for a reasonable pathway through the regulated market. Remove all the things that can cause a fail and create plant health environments that lower pest pressure and disease susceptibility and then they can't get you in trouble for anything. What the industry really needs right now is help with um, best practices. Um, there's a couple groups that are trying to do it, the TCC, the ICFA, um, uh, I'm not up on all of them, but the farmers are communicating to me that, that what's really needed from them is a way to actually differentiate themselves from the other growers. I mean, we're in an era where organic facilities in regulated states are using banned pesticides early on and skating under it. That's absurd disrespect. Yeah, man, that's an absurd disrespect for human life. And, um, you know, yeah, they're totally, man, yeah, totally. And um, that's absurd to me because we can quantify, mitigate, and adjust for these pests. We don't need to poison humans in the process. And it's, you know, the process is raising an intelligence. I think our farmers need to raise an intelligence. And that's kind of been what I've been after, mostly inspired by like the Dragonfly Earth Medicine people, and they said something to the effect of, we don't need any more rich people, we need educated farmers that can farm sustainably so humans can survive. And that's really, I think, the beauty of the regulated era. As we bring things to the forefront and as we examine, the, examine them closely, it shows how much we're relying on a by all means approach with disregard to human health, you know? And I think it's really irresponsible to our fellow people and if you're a farmer growing something that's consumed you have the highest obligation to other humans to act right that's my two cents